This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and just when I start to think I might actually like some jukebox musicals, along comes our next offender, Never Forget, to remind me why I disliked them in the first place. The score for this nostalgia headache is drawn from the catalog of British boy band Take That, who never made it past one hit wonder status in the US, but achieved a respectable amount of success in their home country. In 2006, however, the group had been disbanded for nearly a decade, which is why EMI felt comfortable licensing their songs for this production. Unfortunately for them, Take That rebanded shortly thereafter and promptly disavowed any association with or endorsement of the musical based on their work. Lead singer and songwriter Gary Barlow kinda came around to the idea eventually, possibly because he realized the show could be a boost to the group's reunion, but based on the pro shot filmed in Take That's Home of Manchester, I'm not quite so sanguine. So let's examine the case of Never Forget. With dramatic fanfare and a set that looks like a knockoff of the last company revival, we are introduced to young man Cunian Ash, who is in the midst of proposing to his girlfriend Chloe. You're my lifeline, angel of my lifetime, answer to all answers I can find. It's always hard to write a musical book around pre-existing lyrics, but if these are the lyrics you're starting out with, you're already in trouble. Through a series of flashbacks, which don't have a whole lot to indicate they are flashbacks apart from a sparkly sound effect, we learn how Ash and Chloe got together and that Ash is best friends with Chloe's brother Jake, who initially had a weirdly possessive toxic male freak out at the two of them being together, but now that they're engaged has come around and is eagerly looking forward to his best man duties. Jake is also going to audition for a Take That tribute band, a level of metafiction this show will not be nearly smart enough to pull off, and wants to rope Ash into joining him. Ash is reluctant, but learns that the pub owned by his mother Babs is in imminent danger of foreclosure, and there's some competition with prize money that can save it, and sweet Lucifer, how can this plot be so much of a mess less than ten minutes in? It's not even that the show draws on so many entry-level cliches. In addition to the the save-the-family-business angle, we'll have Ash being torn between the lure of fame and fortune and the true companionship of his friends and loved ones, a venal music executive who will try to seduce him in various senses of the term, a motley crew of misfits who will overcome their initial ineptitude and achieve their full potential. It's that the story built from them has the structural integrity reminiscent of two-thirds of all porcine architecture. Exposition is perfunctory and clumsy, plot developments happen seemingly at random, and ideas are thrown in only to be dropped shortly afterwards. To illustrate, let's have a look at the aforementioned tribute band auditions, which are overseen by Ron Freeman, a man who looks like what you'd get if you took Harvey Firestein and sucked out all the gay. It's his fiance, my sister. Be giving him a hard time about auditioning. Yeah, now I'm bored. Although I will admit he has a certain relatability. Ron is instantly and creepily enchanted with Ash's singing chops and hires him for the Gary Barlow role, and Jake is just as quickly hired to rep Robbie Williams, possibly because he looks like the sort of person who would descend into career-shattering drug problems. And then we get the supporting characters who will round out the group. They are, in order, Adrian, a nerdy bank manager whose wife has lost all respect for him, Dirty Harry, no relation, a stripper who feels called to do something beyond shake his moneymaker for tips, and Jose, an immigrant from Spain with a comical accent and an even more comically overbearing Monty Python caricature of a mother. But why? Well, I want to be a singer, a dancer. I'll be a singer here in Spain. All of this information is introduced via more of those awkward flashbacks, little of it will have any relevance to the plot at large, and most of it will be forgotten beyond a few brief lines here and there. Good storytelling can turn a bunch of tired, overworked tropes into a compelling or at least entertaining narrative, but the work here more closely resembles something out of Abe Simpson's mouth. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. The important thing was that I had an onion on my belt. Which was his style at the time. Adrian, Harry, and Jose are enlisted as Mark Owen, Howard Donald, and Jason Orange, respectively, and they immediately begin training. 
At first, they can barely manage basic step-touch choreography, but after a brief training montage, they're somewhat passable. But Ron has higher ambitions than merely passable and hopes to use the upcoming Battle of the Tribute Bands as the gateway to bigger things. I want a band that can take beyond the competition onto the tribute band circuit. Britain, Europe, the world. I have a vision, see? And it's not enough that the story is badly told, but the stakes are also kind of nonsense. Being in a tribute band isn't exactly the height of music industry success, but this show treats being a take-that knockoff group as the gateway to unprecedented fame and fortune, complete with standard sign-away-your-soul-on-the-dotted-line contract. No late nights, no drinking, no girlfriends. What? I just got engaged. Yeah, no new girlfriends. Fans need to believe you're available. What fans? The group signs their lives away. At least I think they do. The staging is very fuzzy on this point. And they go back to getting themselves performance ready, which for some reason involves sexually harassing their choreographer. I can't believe this girl. Oh, no oh. This number, set to take that and party, is sin number four. The premise is that the proto-pseudo boy band is engaging in a dance-off with their backup dancers. Why do they even have backup dancers? They're a fucking tribute band. They're on the same entertainment level as cruise ship headliners and second-tier Vegas shows. They don't need the whole Beyonce treatment. It's pretty pointless, especially since the choreographer can't seem to figure out just how good the protagonists are supposed to be at what they're doing. Sometimes they're matching the backup dancers step for step, at other times they're forced to rely on cheap pop culture gags and uncomfortable Asian musical pastiche. Awesome. Ron comes in to introduce talent scout and resident femme fatale Annie Barrowman and to yell at the band for screwing around and give a painfully direct speech about their motivations. What about Ash and his mom's pub? Adrian worried about his wife doing the dirty on him. I never said that. You didn't have to. Normally, I hate it when the script doesn't trust the audience to understand what's going on, but honestly, the plot here is so badly developed that it's best not to assume too much. Annie immediately starts hitting on Ash and laying the groundwork for her you have real talent and you shouldn't waste it on things like friendship and loyalty pitch. She escalates the attack during Ash and Chloe's engagement party, which looks like it was staged by the ChatGPT version of Bob Fosse. <laughs> Chloe is very upset when Ash starts ignoring her at their own engagement party, and Ash doesn't understand why, proving that he's not the pointiest pitchfork in the lake of fire and brimstone. So Chloe watches from the sidelines in her modest white dress while Ash dances with Annie in her immodest black dress, really subtle there, and eventually starts downing tequila straight from the bottle as the stage goes all red washed. Oh, you did not just reference one of the greatest dance sequences in musical history in the middle of your barely passable dance sequence. Bad jukebox show, bad, no biscuit! But the more pressing issue is, I really don't believe this love triangle they're trying to set up here. Ash doesn't have chemistry with either woman, Chloe is kind of a cipher for most of the show, and Annie never really projects the cunning and aggressive sensuality for the manipulative man-eater type she's being set up as. Which makes the scenes when Chloe is obviously threatened by her ring hollow. Do you fancy her? No, don't be ridiculous. Because I don't mind if you do, I, I don't, I mean... People in relationships, sometimes they do, don't they? I mean, I mean, they fancy other people. I mean, there's no shame in it, and, and I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't Chloe, she, 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 do you fancy Annie? Because honestly, that's what I'm getting here. I mean, it's okay if you do. Honestly, it would make for an interesting change of pace, and I'm not really buying that Ash fancies her. Ash and Chloe kiss and make up for the time being, and the band... Do they even have a name? Most tribute acts are called something like The Musical Box or Purple Rain or The Fab Foe. Who are these guys? Lower than lower? Whoever they are, they have their first gig and it doesn't go well, as Adrian gets stage fright and pretty soon 80% of them are noping out. So it's up to Ash to get his lips right up next to the mic and start the show. He said she's moved on, you see. All I have is a number. You better ask her, not me. 
this encourages the rest of the group to come in on backup, and they end up a big success. For certain values of the term. Thanks to you, I shall be, I will be the new kings of the, of the tribute band world. <laughs> yeah, that and a good juggling routine will get you like third place on Britain's Got Talent, your point? Ron and Annie are all ready to get Ash in on a solo contract based on the strength of that one performance, with Annie tempting him by offering ten grand, which he hopes to use to save his mum's pub. But to do that, he would have to turn his back on his mates and perform in the competition as, what, a take-that-tribute solo act? A plot this basic should not be this confusing! Anyway, Ash goes to his friends and tells them he's considering Annie's offer, even though Babs isn't really invested in keeping the stupid pub in the first place. Hey, hey, don't drag me into this! Oy. But Ash has decided this is his chance to make something of himself, and he dives headfirst down the situational narcissism slope as he alienates his bandmates Jake and Chloe in quick succession. Yeah, well, Jake's my brother, and I won't stand by while you just go and mess him around! Oh, so this is what it's gonna be like, is it, for the rest of our lives? Everyone else first and me oh, second! don't be ridiculous! You're gonna be my wife, Chloe! Chloe tells Ash that he's changed, something which really isn't conveyed in the acting or the script, but trust her on this, and that she needs more time to reconsider their engagement. And so a disheartened Ash performs the only song American audiences will recognize. Whatever I said, whatever I did, I didn't mean it. I just want you back for good. I want you back for good. Again, a lot of jukebox musicals struggle at least a little bit with finding ways to make the songs and the narrative mesh together, but this one is spectacularly bad at it. At best, the songs convey general vibes rather than specific emotional or dramatic moments. At worst, they're seemingly random. Take the use of Want You Back for the Act 1 finale. Why would Ash and Chloe immediately follow up the major crisis point in their relationship by singing about how they didn't mean to hurt the other and will do anything to get back into each other's good graces? Because it makes for a good set piece with rain and dancers swinging umbrellas about, that's why. The randomness is even worse following intermission, with the remaining four members rehearsing or performing or I'm not even sure what, but it's a big production number with a sort of fashion-based theme, with dressmaker dummies and a couple quick change artists for some reason, and an extraordinary amount of clothing getting ripped off. It just gets more uncomfortable the longer it goes on, so let's keep moving. Everyone is despondent about Ash abandoning them, but Jake encourages them to buck up. All right, we can either mope around here like a less cheerful version of Coldplay. While getting the only halfway decent line in the show. Ron saunters in and the band is none too happy to see him, but he protests his innocence in the group's breakup. We are sitting on a gold mine here. Tribute bands is big business. Yeah, when this competition's over, we'll be raking it in. I'm certain that if I go on Archive of Our Own, I could find a Take That fanfic that's better plotted than this. It wouldn't even need to be a particularly well thought out one. A decent coffee shop AU would do the trick. Meanwhile, Ash is doing all right for himself, rehearsing in a classy suit with leggy backup dancers. Even his former bandmates don't seem to have any hard feelings, as they've managed to recruit Chloe as their new fifth, news which makes Ash second-guess himself. Uh, mate, if you haven't asked Dino yet, I'll still be your best man. Well, there's not gonna be a wedding, Jake. Jake's assurance that his sister will come around isn't very convincing, as the next scene involves Annie taking Ash to a nightclub and making very awkward attempts to seduce him. Once you taste it now. Oh, believe me, you ain't seen nothing yet. Don't believe that the first one for you. It took 90 minutes, but we finally got some decent camp with Annie going full leading player in Pippin. After a tasteful fade to black, Chloe shows up at Ash's place with the intention of patching things up, and what can only be described as spectacularly bad timing. Ash? The heartbroken Chloe tells Ash to leave her alone and sings a sad breakup song that is one of the better utilized in the score. Ash 
Nash, having alienated everyone who cares about him, is backstage at the big competition feeling despondent about having cocked everything up. To drive the point home, Babs comes in and lectures him about said cocking up of everything. What do you want me to do? Pull your head out your backside and look around! <clears throat> Ash is all, I'm doing this for you! But Babs shuts down that argument pretty effectively. Well, you needn't bother, we've lost the pub! What? Yeah. Thanks for taking it, it's gone. Even better, Annie comes in and, after getting a telling off from Babs that Annie hasn't been nearly bitchy enough to deserve, she reveals that the money Ash thought he was getting from his solo contract was actually the price required to buy out his original contract from Ron. So Ash is an idiot who doesn't read the fine print and somehow that's all Annie's fault, and also his entire character arc of needing to choose between material success and true friendship becomes a lot easier as the motivation for said material success no longer exists and the material success never really existed in the first place. So Babs yells at Annie, Ron comes in so Ash can yell at him, and Ron begs Ash not to reveal his part in the whole scheme to the band because he really needs them to be successful. For some reason. Speaking of, they're getting ready to go on stage and need help getting psyched up because Adrian's wife and Harry's stripper pals and Jose's mom are all in the audience and will never see them, but we're still pretending their backstories matter. If I can't perform with you lot, I don't want to perform at all. Well... The guys forgive Ash pretty easily, but Chloe isn't ready to make up and flat out refuses to perform with him. But Jose encourages everyone to okay. soldier on. Now is the time for cojones, you understand me? So, we go out there and, and we show them our cojones, huh? Jose, honey, I think you have this show confused with the full Monty. So the quintet take the stage with the second most ridiculous production number in the entire musical. You know, those costumes are Celestial Infernal cultural appropriation. Oh, and Chloe does have an offstage change of heart for no discernible reason, so she can sing the Lulu part. The pseudo take that win the pseudo competition, and Ron, who is dressed in devil drag for no reason other than a cheap joke, has had a change of heart and is ready to confess his misdeeds. That is why you have to know that it was me. When Ash left, it was Ron who taught me into coming back. Huh? Well, him and me mum. Why are we even giving Ron this dumb redemption bit? He's not an interesting or likable character, and now we're supposed to feel bad for him because he had 30 seconds of a sad song and an embarrassingly bad guy in a dress gag? Anyway, it wraps up as you might expect. Chloe and Ash get back together, the band gets the attention of some record reps, and in accordance to Spamalot rules, we end with a wedding. apparently takes place at Christmas and features the Saturday's Warrior Children's Chorus as the party band. Never Forget wants to be a feel-good silly fluff show, but it doesn't have the skill to pull even that much off. The plot is an absolute mess, the characters are initial concepts that are never developed by either the script or the actors, and the songs are likewise general ideas in search of a story to belong to, making the results, ironically, quite forgettable. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For not being able to come up with a coherent story between them, writers Guy Jones and Danny Brocklehurst are condemned to serve as lab assistants for Dr. Frankenstein. For being a terrible excuse for a seductive temptress, Annie is condemned to be remanded to the custody of Lola from Damn Yankees. Finally, for presenting something that doesn't even have the value of being entertainingly bad, director Ed Curtis is condemned to take remedial lessons in silly musical entertainment by watching the Diana Pro shot. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>